Though your mercy never fails me And all my days I've held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God
Amen, amen, amen. Come on and give the Lord your best hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Uh, you can be seated for just a second. I'm gonna do something a little bit different this morning uh, right here before we transition, before we do anything else. Um, let me ask a few questions and this will just require some honesty on your part and you can uh, answer, you can raise your hand, you can do whatever you want or you can just answer in your mind, all right? Uh, I'm not here to uh, expose anybody or turn anybody out or anything like that, um, but I do wanna minister. You're here this morning and you're just going through it. And I know that's kind of a broad brush right there. You know, spouses that ordinarily everything is harmonious, but all of a sudden you just can't stand each other. The slightest little thing. Is anybody here dominated by, by just being petty right now? Any, the pettiness, like it don't really matter. It ain't a big deal, but man, it just is wearing you out. It's causing disagreements, frustration, things like that. Um, as I was praying this morning, this is what was on my heart was we're going to open up with an altar call. We're going to pray for one another. All right. Uh, I still believe that prayer is the most powerful thing that we can do. I've never changed that. Uh, before I try to do anything on my own, I pray first, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the time when I pray, I realize, oh, I don't have to do nothing anyway, right? Come on, somebody. Have you ever had plans to fix something, but then you prayed about it and realized that if you mess with it, you're gonna mess it up, so just leave it alone and let God do the work? And every once in a while, I get these people that are a lot more spiritual than I am, and they'll say, Pastor, you gotta do more than pray. Sometimes you gotta do more than pray. Exactly what is it that you can do that's more powerful than having a conversation with the most powerful entity who wants you to win, who's literally the author and the finisher of your faith, who has scripted every chapter about your life and positioned you to win. What is it that you can do that's more powerful than that? What is it that you can do that's greater than that, right? I'm here to tell some people today this and, and, and don't miss what I'm saying. Waiting has weight. Waiting has weight. It don't seem heavy in the beginning and that's why it used to didn't bother you so much or it didn't start an argument back then because in the beginning, it, it wasn't that heavy. In the physical, do you know you can, you can take a, a two pound weight and it, it doesn't feel like anything. You can walk around with it. It doesn't feel like anything. You can, you can hold it out right here, just hold it out. And it doesn't feel like anything. But about 30 minutes later, it's only two pounds, but it feels like 50 pounds. And now you're struggling. An hour later, you're sweating, your joints are hurting. It's only two pounds. Come on, stand with me, family. Let me speak something very specific. And if it applies, it applies. If there is somebody that has, somebody from your past that has come back into your life recently and they're saying things to you like, um, you know, I've got a word for you or, you know, God sent me here, I'm, I'm praying for you. And th listen, that's a trap right there. That's a trap. You can never move forward in life when you're looking behind. If you, and if you, keep, if you keep looking back long enough, you'll start reaching back. You keep reaching back long enough, after a while, you'll grab a hold of that thing that you worked so hard to turn loose and walk away from. I'm just trying to help somebody. Who's in your ear right now? Who are you listening to right now? 
I can tell you how you can discern if it's the enemy. What they're saying to you, it makes you feel understood. It, didn't, it don't fix your problem. It don't solve anything. You feel like somebody gets me. It makes you feel better. I'm here to tell you today that the, the worst enemy in your flesh, baby, is your feelings. You cannot trust your feelings. I'm, as, 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 a, as a bigger person, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, ain't nothing feels better than chocolate cake and cheeseburgers running down my lips, right? I'm here to tell you, it, feel, it, it feels good. It feels good. But when I have to hold my breath to tie my shoes, come on, somebody. When I need momentum to get off the couch, I can't just get off the couch. I have to sling myself off the couch. Brother Joe, I got, I, got so, I got so far gone one time, and this is when I knew I had to change. I couldn't, I couldn't get off the couch. I rolled off the couch to my hands and knees and then climbed up the side of the couch so I could stand up. I said, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm only 50 years old. I shouldn't be doing this right here. I'll never make it to 60 or 70 or 80. I got to make a change, but every, but, it, but what I was doing felt good. The enemy has brought somebody into your life right now, and all they're doing is feeding your emotion. All they're doing is feeding your emotion. They're not trying to help you move forward. He brought, there's somebody from your past that has come back into your life, and they have your ear right now. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is exposing that. You need to handle your business. You need to tell them thanks, but no thanks. Pastor, you don't let people speak into your life. I sure do. You know who speaks into my life? The people that have earned the right to speak into my life. They've been there. They've been through the battles, the ups and the downs. This lady sitting on the front row right here. Ain't nobody can make me madder than her. But she's been there. Thick and thin, right and wrong. She loved me when I was good, loved me when I was bad. Right. She can speak into my life. Amen. This guy on the end that I can call him at two o'clock in the morning and he'll wake up and say, what you need, Bishop? With a smile on it. I can, I can hear him smiling through the phone, just ready to, you're ready to do whatever I need done. You see what I'm saying? If it ain't, if it ain't those people, close your ears. They didn't earn the right to say nothing to you. They hadn't earned the right to say nothing to you. If they trying to make you feel better about a situation that you know you wrong about being in, Move on. Don't get comfortable being wrong. On the other side of that, there's two, two things specifically. That's one. Here's the second one real quick. What are you afraid of? God, God's telling you to move. And it, it, it's like you're so afraid that you're going to do the wrong thing that you don't do nothing. And so you just, you're, you're stuck and you're frustrated and you're waiting and you're laying back and, and, and you're not addressing certain things. There's a boldness that you lack, sir. And it ain't just going to magically happen one day. It has to be developed. How do you develop it? Through prayer, fasting, and study of the word. And you need to go deeper than you've ever been before. Search out the deep and the dark, mysterious things of God. And be bold. Be bold. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Stop being a people pleaser. All right? So here's what I'm going to do. If, uh, if either of those things apply to you, I want you to come down to the altar. We're going to lay hands on you and pray for you before we do anything else. Um, or listen, if you just got something else and you want to overcome it, I, we're going to pray for that too. All right, you ain't got to come and make confession to nobody. We're just going to pray for you. Is everybody ready? Anybody? It's hard for me to believe that a church this size. Now, I'm fixing to open this altar. If nobody comes, I'm going to be mad. It ain't no way that, ain't, that we all here and we all right. All right, let's come on down. Let's handle our business. Amen. The other thing I need is I need I need some some Holy Ghost spirit filled people of prayer to come up here with us.
Let's come and pray for some people. And, and if you come up here to be prayed for, but you are spiritual, after we pray for you, pray for somebody else. There ain't nothing wrong with you. There ain't nothing wrong with you. There ain't nothing wrong with you. Well, what about my mistakes? What about them? Don't change who you are. Just as strong as you've ever been, just as powerful as you've ever been, just as bold as you've ever been. That little voice. Oh, messed up. Who didn't? Who didn't? I'm going to introduce somebody after a while that's 95 years old. She made more mistakes. She's made more mistakes than we will ever make. But God still uses them. You know what I mean? Let me speak something over you. When Christianity began, think about this family. When Christianity began, there were available at the time students of the law, students of the word. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were experts. The scribes were the writers of doctrines and Jesus did not use them. You know who he used? He used men that carried knives and would cuss you out and would cut you cut your ear off your head if you got in the way of what they were trying to do. And God took those men and turned them into the apostles and the prophets and the teachers and the evangelists and the pastors. They became the fathers of the church. Ain't nothing wrong with you. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with you. Father, in the name of Jesus today, Father, the first thing that we do is we expose this enemy that has shown up, God, we rebuke this enemy, God, that would come and speak into the lives of your servants, your children. This enemy that would try to bind them, that would try to get them to be still, to not move forward, that would try to get them to go backwards in the name of Jesus. God, I know your nature. Your word says that you make all things new. I don't need yesterday. I don't need anything from the past. You've made all things new. What you have for me is in front of me, not behind me, God. God, if there's something from my past that I need, you'll make a new thing to replace it. In the name of Jesus, God, free our minds today. Free our minds today, Father God. Let us know that, the, that it, it, it's healing that we need, not comfort. It's deliverance that we need, not comfort. I don't need a comforting word right now. I need a word of instruction. I need a word of direction. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you just begin to empty us empty us of all of our resentment, our pain, our pettiness, our hurt. Empty us of all these things. And God, I pray that you'd begin to fill us back up, that you would refill us with your boldness in the name of Jesus. There ain't nothing wrong with you. God can use you. You're not broken. You're not dirty. In the name of Jesus. You know what the word said? The word said, who are you to call unclean that which I have cleansed? In the name of Jesus. I keep hearing this word. You better speak it over your life. I'm not broken. <laughs> I'm not broken. We get confused sometimes. You know what you are? I'm going to help you. Are you ready? You know what you are? Tired. You're not broken, you're not defective, you're not weak. You, you're tired. You're tired. Renew the strength. It takes a lot of strength to wait. Weak, weak people, weak, weak people 
won't survive the waiting. They can't handle the weight of waiting. One of the greatest instructions that you'll ever receive from the scripture, it says this, it says, wait, therefore I say, wait on the Lord, wait on him. And here's the thing, you're not waiting on him to catch up. He's just trying to, uh, he's just trying to get you in line with what he's sending to you. Wait, wait on the Lord. Don't go see that divorce attorney today or tomorrow. Just wait. Just wait. Don't quit. Don't, listen, don't quit that job yet. Just wait. Just wait. I'm going to say this preemptively. The, there's a message coming in just a minute that'll probably make everybody want to leave the church. Don't just wait. Just wait. Just wait. God, teach us to wait again. Teach us. To, thank you. Listen, you ever, you, ever, you ever try to prophesy and you just hear the Holy Spirit say something to you? Here's the problem with, with our waiting. I want to change the way you wait. The reason that you, I just heard this from the Spirit, the reason you're struggling and you're waiting is because you are waiting by yourself. You can't wait alone. You, if, if, you, if you're waiting on the Lord, you might as well go ahead and hide yourself in the secret place of the Lord and wait. If you've ever been to the doctor's office, you don't wait to see the doctor at your house. You go to the office and check in and you let him know I'm here and you wait cause you know he's just on the other side of that wall. You need to get back in, you need to like get some worship music going on in your space. You need to get that Bible back out again and read those scriptures. You need to start praying again in your home. You need to create a spiritual waiting room and let God know I'm waiting. I'm not, but I ain't waiting by myself. I'm waiting. And, and listen. Pastor Tim, you know why we send you to all these hospitals to be with people? so they don't have to wait alone. When you in a, 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 in a moment that affects your life and you sitting there by yourself, overthinking and overanalyzing, man, your, your mind and, the, and, 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 and even, I don't try to give the devil no credit, but even the devil will come in your weakened or your wounded state and when he catches you by yourself, you'll think all kind of crazy stuff. So we'll send Pastor Tim to sit in the hospital with you. So you don't have to wait alone. When you got somebody with you, they can correct some of that crazy thinking. If you don't have some spiritual person in your life right now telling you that you're wrong, then they ain't helping you. That first person that I described right now, listen, I can tell you, I can tell you how I know it's an enemy that has your ear. They're only telling you what you want to hear. I don't know if you've read this Bible or not, but when I read this Bible, it usually don't. Brother Owen, you're a teacher. You're a teacher of the word. You ever hear people say, they say, I love to read the word of God, man. I love it. I don't love it. It makes me feel bad. Every, the, the more I read it, I look at stuff that I don't line up with. It shows me more of what, I, what I'm not than what I am. So if, if the word is constantly correcting me, why do I think God has sent me a prayer partner to just, to, to just compliment me all the time? Listen, you need somebody spiritual in your life that's correcting you. Amen. The only thing worse in your life than being wrong is when you get to the place that you okay being wrong. Amen. Come on and give the Lord a big hand of praise today. All right.
if um, I feel like the conviction will be stronger in the back today so if, if, if you weak and can't handle a strong word you better move to the front all right but change your seats it'll be stronger it's like it's gonna go over and land in the back and wash back to the front hey let me tell you a few things that's that's, uh, that's going on next uh, next Saturday morning at uh, 9 o'clock we're gonna have a work day at our new mission campus 9 to 12. Uh, this is going to be mostly kind of a clean out and a de-junking day. I'm going to go ahead and warn you, I, I need strong arms, strong hands, strong backs. We're just trying to get stuff out of the way so we can begin the renovation remodel process. If you are church sentimental, you don't come to this work day. There will be a dumpster in front and everything that's not going to be a part of the mission will not be left in that building. Like, if it would hurt your feelings to see a church pew sticking out of a dumpster, this is not the work day for you, all right? Now, if there's anything there that you want at your house, you can have it. I have personally, at, at this campus, personally, I have taken entire days of my schedule where I've just scheduled a day to come and throw stuff away here through the years. And you say, Pastor, you should call a work day. No, because then I have to argue with people about why we throw it. They say, that's good stuff right there. I crawled up into one of our attics. I found, I found nine computers, desktop computers in an attic. I started throwing them away and people said, why are you throwing them away? Because they're garbage. That's a good computer. It still works. If it still works, why is it in the attic? Well, we had to get an upgraded one. What do you think we ever going to downgrade? <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think Windows 97 is coming back, family. You know what I'm saying? And when it gets to other things, you know, like, like church pews, for example, people will tell me, they say, Pastor, we should give those to another church. What if I told you that I have called other churches? You know what they tell me? We don't want them. We don't want them. I mean, look around. You see any pews in here? No. Why? People like chairs. Why are they softer? They got cushiony. You can move them around. Well, they, what, if a, what if it's a new church trying to get started? I called those two. You know what they said? We don't want them. They're in a storefront. Our space has to be flexible. It's a sanctuary today. It's a coffee shop in the middle of the week. You know what I mean? We got to move stuff around, right? And so um, uh, for the mission to function and operate, the first thing we got to do is de-junk and declutter. I will give you some, um, uh, some praise reports, though, as we are getting ready to to do some uh, mild renovations, move walls, make, it, make, make everything fit and flow and space and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention his name. He hasn't given me permission to mention his name, but I do have a friend that's a, a GC, a general contractor, and uh, I asked him the other day if he would come on board with us uh, so, all, so we get all our permitting and everything that we need like that. And I said, I want to use local labor. I said, I don't want this. This is, this is the mission. It can't cost no money, right? A mission is a place where you give things away. Missions don't make money, right? Everybody understands that. Missions don't make money. Missions, are, missions give. These, these, this is a place to give, right? And so, uh, uh, and so I asked him, I said, uh, I want you to be, be our GC, uh, officially, legally, do all of, follow all our permit, everything. I want everything to be done with excellence. I want everything to be legal. I don't want none of this shady stuff, you know, like, well, uh, uh, my cousin can do that plumbing work. Is your cousin a plumber? No, he's a car mechanic, but he can do that plumbing work. No. Like, I want a real plumber to do the plumbing work. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Because later on, you're going to have a real plumber that's going to come out here and say, who, who did this? I'm going to say, Tim's cousin. You know what I mean? Tim's cousin, the car mechanic that can, that can do plumbing. Right? You, you see what I'm saying? We've, we've had enough of that. Let's be excellent. Let's do it correct. But, I, but, but here's the catch. And I told him, I said, and I want you to do it for free. 
I want you to waive all your fees. I don't want you to charge me that big old GC price that you charge. I want you to give it to the mission. And, um, and I told him, I said, you don't even have to pray about it, do you? He said, nope, I'll do whatever you need. And so, uh, man, like I said, so everything's falling in line, uh, you know, and, and, and like I said, our, our, our new GC's coming on board, and so uh, everything will be above board and filed and legal. They want, the worst thing you can ever do is do something from the Lord, uh, do something for the Lord, and do it dishonestly. And then right about the time you think that you're ready to really help some people and you've already justified your lack of integrity in some areas and say, well, I'm doing it for the greater good, that the devil's going to show up right about the time you get big enough. He's going to show up and hand you that hand grenade, pull the pin and walk away and say, you deal with it. Amen. So we'll do it right. We're going to be honest, do everything above board. I ain't trying to hide nothing from nobody. He said, Pastor, sometimes them people just charge too much. Well, listen, I don't know the God you serve. The one I serve ain't broke, all right? He ain't broke. So that's coming up. Um, uh, put my mission slide up there. This is uh, what I'm most excited about. Not that mission, the mission offering slide. I'm sorry, I, I'm confusing there. Our mission offering, there you go. Uh, December 17th is going to be Christmas at the cathedral. We're gonna celebrate that morning. Uh, our generational choir will be up here center stage. That'll be uh, kids and middle school and high school and adults and senior adults all singing, worshiping together. It's gonna be a great, great day uh, on the 17th. But that day we're also receiving our annual World Missions Offering. Years ago, somebody said, Pastor, why do you receive a missions offering during the holidays? Tis the season for giving. That's why, right? Listen, it, Christmas is not about Santa Claus. I like Santa Claus. There is a 16-foot Santa standing in my front yard right now. I ain't got a problem with Santa, all right? But it ain't about Santa. It ain't about the Grinch. Come on, somebody. Am I help? It ain't about Charlie Brown and his Christmas special. This is about Jesus. Now, I do want to make a confession. My granddaughter hurt my heart yesterday because, um, well, you need some backstory. First of all, she does not like baby dolls. She, can't, she don't want a baby doll for nothing. I keep trying to put little babies in her hands. She throws them down. And my wife found a little Jesus and a manger that was plush, like it's a soft little Jesus and a soft little manger. And I gave it to her. I said, hey, Share Bear, hey, Bear, look here. Pop's got you a little Jesus. And she, and he's veiled, Jesus has velcroed in the manger for safety. <laughs> and she pulled Jesus off the manger and threw him down. <laughs> and I told her, I said, see, there's this typical, typical Christmas right here. Just throw Jesus away. <laughs> she ain't even two years old. The world has already affected her. She likes big Santa in the front yard, but she just threw, ripped Jesus out the manger and threw him to the ground. Anyway, uh, listen, it's time to give. And it's, when it's Christmas time, it's time to be generous and it's time to give. Amen. It's time to give with purpose. And so um, um, we're going to receive one offering and then I'm going to split it between um, three of our our. Uh, we do a lot of mission work here, but these are kind of three of our top missions. LAT 318 is our ministry to uh, Venezuela. Oscar and Angela are actually here this morning, so I'm around the building earlier. Um, Poppy's Kitchen in Indonesia. I uh, talked to Tommy a few months ago. Poppy's Kitchen has just started this year um, a, a ministry to rescue people from uh, sex trafficking in Indonesia. Uh, and actually, uh, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population on the planet. Uh, the nation of Indonesia, again, largest Muslim population on the planet, larger than any, any Middle Eastern country. It's Indonesia. But there is a move of God that's happening in Jakarta. They're estimating right now that, that some eight to 9,000 people a day are calling on the name of Jesus to be saved. There's a, they, they, they're calling it the third Pentecost. I mean, God is moving there. He's moving. But uh, um, uh, Islamic terrorists are targeting pastors' children 
they're kidnapping Christian pastors' children and putting them, selling them into the sex industry. And so Poppy's Kitchen, which was uh, for the longest time uh, addressed the, the, the needs of homeless children, now has shifted gears and he's partnered with some guys that are big enough and strong enough and don't care enough that they can go and rescue these children. Sometimes, sometimes you do have to kick a door down. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, but, but, um, uh, so far, they have already they have rescued. Uh, when I talked to him the other day, 16, uh, 16 pastors' kids that they've been able to go and, and locate and bring them back home. But once you bring them home, you have to move that pastor's where they have to relocate the whole family. They got to put them somewhere different after that. And so it costs a lot of money. But uh, so we're, we support that. And then uh, Berea Theological University, uh, you guys remember earlier in the year, I come and I said, hey, God put it on my heart. I want to help uh, our school, our university out. Last year we helped them and they became fully accredited. Uh, so it's a fully accredited university in Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, they've now they are fully accredited for the entire continent of Africa. So it doesn't matter what nation you live in in Africa. Uh, if, if you go to Berea, it's recognized in your nation too, and they're working on the accreditation now for the U.S. What does that mean for us uh, over here? Why would we? Why is that important for us? Because you can you can get a fully accredited degree from Berea, our school, right? You can get a fully accredited degree from there online. Are you ready? for $1,500 a semester. Some of you looked up here like, that's not impressive at all. You just wait, I got two kids in school right now. Wait, just wait. What about the HOPE grant? I'm, I'm glad that it's there and I use every penny that all the lottery ticket buyers give me. Thank you. But it don't pay for what you think it pay for. <laughs> Amen. When they, listen, when you hear a politician say, you can go to school for free in Georgia. No, you can't. No, you cannot. You get the hope grant. It don't pay for everything. All right. So anyway, um, uh, the college was, uh, was, was ready to close down whenever we came along and partnered with them a couple years ago. You fast forward to now, uh, uh, the bike ride, uh, my bike ride team that we just did, we just raised $50,000 for Berea. Why you do that? We're trying to raise another uh, 100 to go along with it because we need to build another dormitory. Our dorms are full. Two years ago, they were fitting to put this place, this place was fitting to go on the market for sale. Our dorms are now full. Our dorms are full. Are you, is anybody hearing that? Our dorms are full, right? And so, um, um, and, and we're trying, they're trying to be creative for, for, for more housing to get more people in there. So I partnered with a separate group of people. I didn't come to the church. I, I wear you guys out for money all the time. So I didn't come here. I got with a second group of people. So we're going to help them. We're going to raise this money. We're going to do this. And so we've raised the first 50 of the 150. And we're going to build new dorms. And we're going to build a chapel on the campus there too out of that group. But I come back this year and I ask us, I said, um, they need, uh, uh, they have a cafeteria building. It needs to be rented innovated and it needs a commercial kitchen built in it. So I'm here to report today, you guys paid for all of that. It was around $20,000, uh, uh, you gave it, we raised it, you paid it. Um, and so on the 17th, I'll make a presentation to you guys. I'll show you all the pictures. I was recently there, uh, did an interview with President Reigns there on the campus so we can show you the brand new uh, cafeteria or the newly remodeled cafeteria and the brand new commercial kitchen at Berea University that you guys paid for, amen. And so, uh, so we'll, we'll show all that then. But I want between now and then, pray about what you want to give, right? And here... I don't think I've ever asked it this way before, but I'm going to ask it today. I want you to give something crazy. Just be crazy. Just give something crazy. I know some of you are looking right now and saying, Pastor, if I gave $25 right now, that would be crazy. I will, I'm going to ask you to give whatever God puts on your heart. When I learned about giving myself I was at a place and they were taking up an offering to help a mission and the, the guy said this now again I'm, I'm I was a sophomore in college 
when I got saved. I don't know nothing about church or anything like that. You know, I didn't know about tithing. In the back then, I would just go and when it was time for the offering, I would open up my wallet and whatever the biggest bill I had in, I would put in there. And um, that preacher caught me with a hundred a couple times. After that, I always made sure I didn't carry hundreds to church. I, I was all right. I give Jesus twenty. I give him twenty. Feel good about it. A hundred hurt my feelings. So, um, but I didn't understand tithing. I didn't understand giving. I didn't understand any of that. And this guy gets up there and he says, whatever God puts on your heart, give it. Even if you don't have it, give it. Well, how can I give what I don't have? He said, ask God to give it to you. Ask God to give it to you. And as he gives it to you, just give that. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. Whatever God tells you to give, I want you to give it. And if you have it, then swipe the card or write the check. But if God gives you something, if he puts an amount on your heart to give and you don't have it, then trust God for it. Now, here's the thing. If he don't send it to you, you don't owe nothing. But if all of a sudden, money that you wasn't counting on starts showing up, guess where that belongs? Let's trust God in that thing, all right? I ain't trying to... I, I, I've been to the church before where they would tell, they'll tell you to give your last dollar. I ain't telling you that. I'm telling you to give God's money away. Anybody pick that up? Like if I gave you my credit card today and told you to go to the mall and enjoy and have a and just have Christmas on me until the card don't work no more, you'd be okay with that, right? You just go, you swap that thing until it stops. You wouldn't be price selecting nothing. You wouldn't look for a sale. You would go get what you wanted, right? That's what I'm saying. Let's trust God that way. God, you tell me what you want me to give, and that's what I'm going to give, right? And if you can afford it, then pay for it. If, you, if it's something you can't afford, then trust God for it. I'm not, telling you to, I'm not telling you to take your kids' Christmas money. That's not what I said. But if you'll pray about it, let God give you the money, and then you just, you just send it through, all right? Is that okay? Anybody ever heard anything? Like that? I know it sounds a little bit weird. Speaking of giving, it's time to give. All right. It's time to give today's offering. How do you give an offering at Coastal Cathedral? Three ways you can do it. If you have our church center app, you can do it there. If you don't, you should get it because that's also how you get connected here. And then, uh, But once you walk out the, build, out the sanctuary in the main concourse, you can go to one of our giving stations where you can swap a card or you can put check or cash in an envelope. You can drop it in a box there. That's how you give here. Amen? Get connected. Again, download the Church Center app. You can get connected with us. Um, that missions offering that's coming up, it's going to change their life. It's going to change your life. Amen? I'm telling you. So some of you don't know about giving yet, but you're going to before the day is over, I promise. Is everybody ready for the word? All right, here we go. Now, I want to go ahead and, and, and start. Anybody ever been to a theme park before? Probably everybody, you know, Six Flags, Disney World, something like that. Wild Adventures in Valdosta, Georgia, right? No? no? Yes? Okay. Before you get on any thrill ride, there's always a sign that says, it, it, it gives dimensions. You have to be this tall, right, to ride this ride. And then it'll say, if you're pregnant, you shouldn't ride this ride. If you have a bad back or if you have a, a, a weakened heart condition, you shouldn't ride. It's a disclaimer, right? Um, Pastor Beth, I need a, I wish I'd thought about this ahead of time. I need a disclaimer that we could just put up on the screens for certain things I'm going to preach that would say something like this. It would say, if, um, if, if you are easily offended and you are not interested in drawing closer to Jesus, you should not hear the remainder of this message. So, uh, um, but if somebody on our graphics team, if you could, we need a disclaimer that we could start putting up. Somebody go ahead and look at your neighbor on the left and say, get ready. Look at your neighbor on the right and tell them it's going to be rough. This ain't going to be an easy one today. I don't expect a bunch of amens. Uh, so I'm going to give you a signal. Like if you see me do this right here, that's your signal to just say amen. Just whether you feel it or not, let's try it. We're going to need a few of those today. 
When I first started preaching, I actually carried my grandfather to a revival I was doing. And I told him, I said, uh, he, he was my Paul Fred. I said, I said, Paul Fred, listen, this church I'm going to today, I said, man, it's an old hole in this church. And I said, I'm, I'm young and, 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 you know, they, they ain't going to like the way I'm dressed or the way that I'm, the way I look, but their pastor's convinced I'm supposed to come preach this revival and I'm not their flavor, you know, and, and this is going to be rough. I said, so if I get out there in the deep and I'm struggling, I, I, I need an amen. I said, I'm going to do this right here and you're going to shout amen. He said, okay. And I was just joking. I was just joking. But sure enough, man, that was a rough crowd. I'm here preaching my guts out. You couldn't buy amen. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't buy hallelujah in that joint. It was rough. And about halfway through the thing, at the most inappropriate time, it didn't even fit. I just did this because I felt like it was a fly on me or something. I didn't know my grandpa had been sitting there the whole time waiting for his moment. I did that. That joker's on his feet, clapping his hands. Amen, amen. And it didn't even fit the moment. And then after church, he was, he was telling me, he said, he, he come to me, he said, I did a good job, didn't I? <laughs> you sure did, Paul. You, you did it. You did it. Amen. So, uh, so again, we might, we, might, we might need some of those amens today. Here we go. Here's the word. Are you ready? It's time to put God to the test. It's time to put God to the test. Either you're God or you're not. Either he's God or he ain't. All right? Anybody want to go on this journey with me? Anybody scared? Anybody scared of the Lord? Well, you better be. If you ain't scared of the Lord, you dumb. And that's not my opinion. That's the scripture. The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. You can't even get wise if you ain't afraid of the Lord. The Bible says, tempt not the Lord your God. He tells us, you cannot put me to the test. Don't you dare test me. Except in one place. There's one place in the scripture, just one. In the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, from end to amen, there's one passage in the whole Bible where God looks back to the people and says, you can prove me in this thing. You can put me to the test in this thing. Only one place. So here we go. Here's our spiritual journey for today. We're going to put him to the test. I hope you're ready, big man. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8. This starts off with an extremely offensive statement. Verse number 8, it says, Would a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, exclamation point. Have you ever got a text message from somebody that had a bunch of exclamation points behind their message? What does that mean? Like this is a serious conversation, right? You get something from somebody and it's in all caps and it's got 27 exclamation points. It means they screaming in your face. So when I look at the, um, when I look at the scripture, will a man rob God? Question mark. That's God asking a question that he already has the answer to. God's being a little bit facetious in this moment. He said, would you rob me? And before you can answer, he yells, you already have. You ever been in one of those conversations? If you married, you've had one of those conversations where you walk in, you don't, you think everything's good. And then they ask you a question and before you can answer it, they yell the answer at you. Would you rob me? You already did. Don't tell me you wouldn't cause you did. But you say, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? Mm. It's going to get uncomfortable from this point forward. I was preaching a message like this one time and immediately after the service, the deacons wanted to have a meeting with me and they said, Pastor, you can't preach messages like that. And I said, why? And they said, you're going to run people off. I said, you won't run no tithers off. You might run some stingy people off, 
but I don't know if you know this or not, we had been paying for them. They wasn't paying us, so we'd be better off without them. Man, that's a bold statement, isn't it, from the Lord? Could you imagine, if, it, if we're talking about God personified, God in human form and you're just having a conversation with him and you can tell he's frustrated and he looks at you and he says, you stole from me. <laughs> God, I thought we were tight. I did too till you stole from me. God, I thought, that, I, thought, I thought me and you were like best friends. We're bros, business partners. You said you stick closer to me than any brother. He said, I will and you stole from me. That's about as in, in your face as you can get. Have you, ever, have you ever messed up in, in a relationship before and been confronted like that? You remember how you felt? You ever hurt somebody? You ever, you ever betrayed somebody? Here's God saying, I didn't hold anything back from you. I have freely given you everything. I remember um, God's friend. Anybody know who God's friend is? The Bible only really tells, tells us about one of his friends. Anybody remember? I can see all the Bible teachers out there, the wheels are turning. David. A little David? God's friend or was it Abraham? There you go. <laughs> Abraham left everything he knew to follow a God that he had never seen. First place he gets to, Abraham was blessed. He had a good looking wife. First place he gets to, the king of the land looks down, sees that good looking woman and the king ain't trying to do nothing bad. He sends a message and says, hey, tell me who that good-looking woman is showed up with that weird-looking stranger out of the desert. Who's that right there? And Abraham got afraid, and he said, that's my sister. <laughs> How are you on this spiritual journey? Trust in God, and now all of a sudden you got to lie to get yourself out of something. God, I trust you. You're my friend. Am I your friend? Am I really your friend? Because you didn't trust me with your wife. You didn't trust me with your family. I mentioned that little boy, David. David did the same thing one time. David, the Bible says that at the time where the kings would go to war, David was at home. That's the first problem there. Some of you are struggling just simply because God's telling you to go fight and you're just hanging out at the house. He's telling you to go minister, you hanging out at the house. While David's hanging out, at, had he been fighting like he's supposed to, this wouldn't have happened. But while he's waiting around, he's walking around on top of the uh, uh, city walls to see what he can see. Lo and behold, he sees a woman taking a bath. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, he didn't accidentally see her. She was at a ceremonial pool of cleansing. She was taking a bath where she was supposed to be taking a bath. And David goes by, he's taking a look. Her name is Bathsheba. He looks down, he says, I'd like to have me some of that. And he did. And then he found out she was pregnant and he comes up with this elaborate scheme to get her husband to come home and sleep with her and then it'll be his baby. But he comes back and he sleeps at the city gates. He said, my brothers are dying in the field. I can't come back and sleep with my wife. My brothers are out there. I gotta go back. And so then David puts up this plan. He, he gives him a letter. He says, don't you open this and read it. And the man carries his own death certificate back, gives it to his commanding officer. The order said, the order said to, to, to take, take Uriah, take him into the, take him into the heat of the battle. And when you're surrounded, back out and leave him there. Man dies in the field. And David thinks, I got away with it. And then there's a prophet named Nathan that shows up one day and says, we got a problem in the kingdom. 
we got a problem, David. What's the problem? What, what kind of problem we got, Prophet Nathan? <laughs> the problem is there was a poor man and he had one little lamb. And there was a rich man that had many lambs, but the rich man wanted the poor man's lamb. So he killed the poor man and took his lamb. And David jumped up and said, tell me who he is. I'll kill him today. And Nathan said, you are the man. You the one. You could have had any woman in this kingdom, not to mention the wives you already have. And poor old Uriah over there with one little wife. David said, God, don't you remember me? I'm the, I'm the psalmist, the songwriter. I'm the worshiper. David, God, God, when you talk about me, you tell people, you say, that little shepherd boy right there, he's after my whole heart. And God said, yeah, you are. And you stole from me anyway. See, this isn't an accusation that God's making. This is a statement of fact. The evidence has been produced. The items that you have stolen are in the trunk of your car and you don't have a receipt. You are guilty. You have stolen the tithe and the offering. That's too convicting. Let's move to verse 9. I'm sure it lightens up as we go deeper. Notice the lack of amens. Told you it was coming. What's crazy is some of you rob God and you'll leave here and be mad at me because you robbed him. You'd be mad at me because I said something about it. In verse number 9, yeah, it gets better. Look at there. You are cursed with a curse because you robbed me. This whole nation is cursed because you robbed me. There are over 7,000 promises in the Bible that God has made to a man. Over 7,000 times. Now, Typically, when we're talking about God's promises, we only want to talk about the ones that have a blessing attached to it. Those are the promises that we preach about, teach about. Those are the promises that we, uh, that we put in greeting cards. Come on, somebody. Those are the promises that we, we get a little tattoo. <laughs> Jeremiah 29. I know the thoughts that I have you thoughts of good and not of evil so you'd have a future and a hope thank you Lord thank you for thinking good things about me I'm here today to tell you with a hundred percent trust in what I just read that what you just read in verse 9 is just as much a promise as every blessing scripture you can find if you rob God you are cursed. That's a promise. Surely if we keep going, this will get better. Like at some point, at some point, we're going to read a verse where God says, nah, just kidding. Gotcha. Because God's funny. I mean, you can't live on this planet and think God don't have a sense of humor. I, I, I've, I've, I've made this analogy before. This, if, you, if you come to church here, this ain't new. You want me to tell you how I know God has a sense of humor? Are you ready? One word. You ready? Platypus. You ever seen one of those? It's a, it's a mammal that is also kind of a marsupial that is also kind of a, a duck and a beaver. And it lays, it, it lays eggs like a reptile. And are you ready for this? He's poisonous. You don't want to get bit by no platypus. You will die. 
true, true stuff. It's almost like God made all the animals and he said, let's make one more. What do you want to make, God? What maj majestic creature you want to make? And he's like, What's, what we got left in the box? Let's put all that together. Send it to Australia. We're good. Listen, you, want, you don't believe God's got a sense of humor, just look around in this room. Hey, people I look at, when I'm looking at you, you might think the same thing when you look at me, but when I'm looking at you, I'm like, God, what were you thinking? <laughs> like, what did they do? What did their parents do? <laughs> Surely this is going to get better, right? Because God has jokes. So let's go a little deeper. Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this. Try me now, says the Lord of hosts. It's important that it says, try me, says the Lord, because this is not Malachi saying, put God to the test. This is Malachi has written down and recorded what God said. God said, try me in this and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, pour out for you such blessing that there's not even room enough for you to receive it. Is there anybody listening to me today that you've been complaining this week because you just got too much? Anybody? Anybody walking around like, God, you just need to stop. I, I just can't hold it all. You wearing me out, God, I just... I'm so blessed that you're breaking my back. I just, God, stop. Just close the windows for just a minute. Let me catch my breath. Anybody out there with this problem? You know how, I'm, okay, you know why you don't have that problem? Because you've been stealing. Verse 10 requires a lot of unpacking. I'm going to have them wrinkles in my forehead before this day's over. When God gave me this word a few weeks ago, I told him I wasn't going to preach it, and he made me sick last week, so I had to come preach it. Did he really make you sick? I don't know. I wasn't sick before I told him I wasn't going to preach it, and then I was sick when I told him I was, and then I repented and said, I'll say whatever you want me to say, and I feel better. Coincidence? Maybe. But the next time he tells me to do something, I ain't going to argue with him. <laughs> Was it God? Was it not God? I don't know, but I know I ain't going to do it no more. Everybody say this with me. It's going to hurt your feelings. Say it with me. All the tithe. It's actually plural in that when you read it in the text, all the tithes, tithes, it's plural. So what is a tithe anyway? New believers, people new to the Lord, and they'll ask me that. They'll say, Pastor, we're talking about tithes and offering. What is a tithe? So tithe is 10%. The why is it 10%? The word, the word tithe in the Hebrew literally means a tenth. That's why, that's why it's 10% because that's just what the word means, 10%. Why did the church land on 10%? Listen, if it was me, I would have said 25%. <laughs> but it's not me. 10%. The question that I've been asked more about this topic than any other question as long as I've been a pastor. Are you ready for this? The number one question when people want to know about tithing, they'll say, Pastor, do I tithe on the net or on the gross? To which I respond, that depends. Do you want a net blessing or a gross blessing? As for me and my house, I prefer the gross blessing. I like that big old nasty blessing that just pours out and you just can't stop it. It's just everywhere, just gross. <laughs> the 
most of us are taught to tithe on our income. And that's why the question is, do I tithe on the net or the growth? I'm here to help you today and tell you, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what I do. How's that? I don't just tithe my income. I tithe my increase. Let me repeat that. I don't tithe my income. I tithe my increase. In my mind, I have a financial picture of all of my assets. It's almost like everything that I own or possess or that, actually, truth be told, I'm the owner of nothing and the steward of everything. I don't own nothing. It's all his anyway. But in my mind, what he has trusted me with, all my financial stability, all my financial history and assets, in my, in my mind, I picture it as one large pile. And every time that pile increases, I tithe. I don't care if it comes in from a paycheck or a handshake or I sold some land or sold a house or I found, found some money on the street. I don't care where it comes from. Every time my pile increases, I tithe on it. Sometimes I'll even look at other blessings that come my way that may not be financial, but they have benefited me. And, and there's a numeric figure to it. Like I know, man, because this happened for me, this open, wow, you know, that, that made such a difference in my life. So I'll put a number on it. This is worth this to me. And I tithe on that. I'm waiting for, I, I, in my mind, I had prepared myself that the whole church would just jump up and clap their hands at that point in time, but you did not. And so um, I have just discovered that I'm pastoring the, a majority of, of, of net tithers. Okay. Let's see if we can shift you to the growth and, and beyond and beyond. See, every paycheck, um, uh, uh, before taxes, uh, before, b before, b b before withholdings. Every gift, every, uh, every sale, every trade, every blessing that comes my way, I send a tithe out. Every time. Every time. I just keep sending it out. And I've come today to let everybody here know you, you, you heard it, but we don't always practice it, but I'm here to tell you that this principle, you cannot outgive God. You cannot do it. You cannot outgive God. You can't give so much that he's not going to give that and more back into your life. Does anybody believe that today? I, I, by, by round of applause, if you believe you can't outgive God, let me hear it. Okay, so if you believe that you can't outgive God, why are you always trying to negotiate the price? Come on, somebody. I mean, God tells you to give something. Why are you trying to negotiate with it? Well, you know, Lord, I got, I got this car payment coming up. That's why he's, try, he's trying to set you up to pay your car off. You... When did we start believing so small? First encounter I had on the campus of Berea University, I'm walking around this, this campus that looked like it had just been abandoned. And the, the law in uh, Zambia is a little bit different there because, um, you know, the state kind of owns everything. You, you own the land, but if you're not using it, the state can seize it. Did you hear what I said? If you're not using it, you own it, but if you're not using it, or if somebody else starts using it, the state will deed it to them. And this college campus was at that place. They had already lost a piece of land because somebody else started using that piece. And so whenever Dr. Raines goes to Africa and he's cleaning up the building, he's doing all this stuff and he's the only one there. And he goes over to the other building to find that there are people in there conducting business. And he goes to court to try to file a thing. And the court says, no, 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 that's their land. It can't be their land. I have the deed. That deed is worthless. You weren't doing anything with it. They're doing something with it. We gave it to them. And we're looking at it saying, that ain't fair. Listen, that's exactly what your Bible says God will do. It said, that, uh, it said that the master of the house had given unto his servants the talents based upon their ability to one he gave five, to one he gave two, to one he gave one. And at the end of it all, the one that five, he invested it, he had 10. The one with two, he did some work with his. And the master of the house, he had four, but the one that had the one, he said, 
I knew that you were a hard task master. I knew you would reap where you have it sown. So I took the one that you gave me. I hid it because I knew you was coming back. Now here, look, I got the one that you gave me. He takes it from him, cast him into outer darkness, takes the one and says, hey, you that I gave the five, take this one and do something with it. Do you ever wonder why there's some people that you know and it seems like they're always walking into blessing and you always struggling trying to hold on to what you got. At some point, you got to understand that God wants to have a relationship with you. God doesn't want to be a part of your life. He wants to do life with you. That's his whole plan for us. We're in this together. And you over there trying to hold on to what you got. And God's over there saying, listen, if you'll let go of that little bit right there, I got something bigger I'm going to put in your hand, but you got to trust me and let that go. God, I knew you was going to ask for it. I said, hold on to it. I got it. I got it. He'll take it to you and give it to the one that's over there doing something. I'm walking on this. I'm walking on this Berea campus for the first time, walking around, and Dr. Rains is devastated. He'll tell you the same story. He didn't know. He kind of took the assignment sight unseen. Imagine his surprise when he shows up and like you're the president of this new university. <laughs> that place was a dung heap. We're walking around, and, I'm, and, I, and I, I see the buildings. I see the properties. I could, I could see the potential. I could say, man, God, I can see what you're going to do here. And I asked this question. I said, I said Dr. Rains, what, what do you need? And he kept asking for small stuff. I told him, I said, brother, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I didn't, I didn't come. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't fly in, 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 in this a big old body to be in a little airplane seat. So he said, Pastor, why didn't you fly first class? Because Zambia, like at that time, they were only letting Emirates was the only one they were letting fly into their country at that time. And the difference from economy to business was about a $7,000 difference in the ticket. You want to fly first class on Emirates from here to Lusaka? That's a $27,000 ticket. And those people look comfortable in, those, in them pods. And after 15 hours in the air and I was folded up like a lawn chair, I would have paid $27,000 now that you got me hurting in my back. But I didn't know in the front, you know what I'm saying? But um, I told him, I said, listen, I didn't just fly that Emirates plane all the way over here, brother, to get over here and you tell me that you need $200 to pay the rent. Like, what's the big thing? What, what does God want to do here? And he kept telling me the small thing. And then I told him, I said, brother, listen, I, I love you. I appreciate you. It looks like you've wasted my time and I've wasted your time. I'm going to call and see if I can just get me an early. I'm supposed to stay for 10 days. I'm going to leave. I'm going I'm to get a flight tomorrow. I want, and, and he comes to my room later and he says, um, he said, I ain't never had nobody talk to me like that. Because the last thing I told him was this. I said, one day you'll figure this out, my brother. You will never, ever hear God say this in your prayer time. Don't ask me for that. I can't do it. You, in, in, your, I'm telling you, in your prayer time, you will never, ever, ever hear God say these words. That's too big for me. I can't handle that one. That's too much. You'll never, ever, ever hear God say that. Now, he might tell you that's too much for you. Your character won't let you hold that. But you'll never hear God say it's too much for him. Right? And I said, when you figure that out, give me a call. He comes to my room later on and says, ain't nobody ever talked to me that way. And I said, that just lets me know that you ain't got no friends. Because somebody should have told you, brother, a long time ago, if you're going to get in this kind of work, you can't be no missionary and have a small vision. You can't go to a third world country where you got to trust God for everything and present yourself as a beggar. You got to present yourself as a believer. God has taken you and he's positioned you in a place where there is nothing. And if you'll trust him in it, he'll pour it all out right here so the nations will know that he is God. 
that began a beautiful partnership and a beautiful relationship right there. Our church owned a piece of property that was worth at the time, maximum value. Are you ready for this? Three hundred thousand dollars. That's what a tax assessor had it valued at. Maximum value: three hundred thousand dollar piece of property. But nobody wanted to buy it. We needed to sell it. There was some debt that the ministry needed to cancel. We didn't need the land. We wanted to sell it. Nobody wanted to buy it. Why didn't they want to buy it? Because at some point after the church had bought it the government in all of its wisdom decided that they would come and survey the land and delineate it. Almost half of it is wetlands. You know what you can build on wetlands? Nothing. Nothing. Nobody, no developer wants to buy uh, uh, acres of land when you can't use half of it. Well, we could have sold it to duck hunters. No, we couldn't because it was between two subdivisions. <laughs> Nobody wanted to buy it. And then if you're going to make matters worse, some, one of those subdivisions found out we were trying to sell it. They didn't want us to sell it. They liked the fact that they had woods in their backyard. So they started walking around on the land, trespassing. If I'd have called them, I'd have shot them. Trespassing. I'd have been within my rights. Georgia's a stand your ground state. Just shoot them in the woods. Imagine my surprise when I show up with my attorney and some attorneys from some prospective people that might want to buy this worthless piece of land. And, and I show up there and there's some people that I don't know and they have pictures of two Civil War headstones. You know what you can build on a cemetery? Nothing. So I got a $300,000 piece of land. We do. It's, it wasn't mine. It wasn't my debt. It's your debt. I'm just a pastor here. Amen. We owned a worthless piece of land. Valued at $300,000 that nobody wanted. And I pulled our board together one day and I said, I ain't going to tell this to the church. But Church of God World Missions that we partner with is launching a new program. They're going to receive the first offering at this year's General Assembly for that. 100% of all the money will go to the mission project. And it was actually going to be this Berea project that, that we're with. And I told them, I said, um, I want us to give an amount. I don't want to take up an offering from the church. I just want us to write the check for it. We gave our church, we gave the largest offering for the church of God. And if you don't know much about the church of God, church of God is 22 million people in 178 different countries around the world. We gave the largest offering in that missions offering. Our church did for the whole denomination. Gave the largest offering in that. Now, what was crazy, it kind of leaked out. And people started coming to me and they said, Pastor, you should have told us I would have sewn into that. And so then I opened it up to the whole church. But uh, our board, our council had, uh, it was a specific, very specific number. It was weird. It was 13, what was, where's Brother Scott? What was it? It was like $13,750. Does that sound about right? It was like a very specific amount. And that's what we sent. We just sent it. God said, send it. We just sent it. When I came back and I mentioned to the church what we had sent, this part of the church gave another eleven, twelve thousand dollars like within two weeks. We just came in. That amount of money flooded into there to the point that they completely renovated the campus. So now they're using it. They're not going to lose it. All that. You know what I'm saying? So we gave that away. 20 something almost $30,000 in one clip boom just gave it away just like that and then I got a phone call from a potential buyer that had been trying and trying and trying to buy that piece of property and we were going we were we were going to
going to sell it uh, like for five hundred thousand dollars or something. Like we just trying to we we're trying to just get rid of it, and we're going to sell for five. We'll take three, right? We just let's get rid of it. Pastor Beth, am I kidding when I tell you the day we put that check in the mail, this guy called me and he said, I want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to a lawyer. I don't want to, I don't want to get together with any more realtors. And he drove from Atlanta down here and we sat right there in that front, in, in, in the front parking lot. And he said, I'm putting some investors together to buy that land. I need some time. I don't, he said, uh, we, we, we're going to do it. Let me rent the land from you for, um, I think it was $10,000 a month at the time or something like that. We went four or five months. He just gave me a check every month, $10,000, $10,000, $10,000, just so we wouldn't sell it to anybody else. And he knew, like I knew, that it was worthless, but he wanted it. It finally cleared. We finally sold that thing, too. It got crunch time. It got, let me help somebody. It got crunch time. And he was invested. He had paid attorneys. He had paid survey. He paid. He said, "I got so much money in it now. I have to. Buy, I can't back out now. I have to buy it." And I said, "Well, man. I said, listen. You guys have. We've extended, extended, extended. I said, talk to the board. They don't want to extend anymore. We're gonna move on to somebody else." And he said, "No, I still want it." I said, "Well, the price changed." He said, "Well, what's the what's the what's the price? Would it go up from five? I said." It's going to take, if you want it today, it's going to take $1.2 million if you want it today. He said, we'll close in 15 days. And we sold a piece of land that was worth $300,000 that had uh, half of it is wetlands. And now it has a Civil War graveyard on it. <laughs> is anybody picking up what I'm putting down? And you can tell me you don't believe in God if you want to. But I've worked with bureaucracy and government long enough to tell you, I can tell you that had God wrote all over it right there. Amen. So, amen. Amen. And so listen, some, some of you get bogged down in the details and the numbers. What does all that have to do with anything? Let me tell you, God never does anything that's not connected to something else. Are you ready for this right here? Like we had this big old fat church payment. Anybody have a big mortgage? Anybody got a big mortgage? Your mortgage ain't junk. Imagine my surprise when I come to be the pastor of Coastal Cathedral and find that mortgage payment. I think back then it was like $26,000 a month. That ain't a year, that's a month. $26,000. Who do I need to kill? My gun, son of a... That'll make a preacher cuss on a Sunday. Are you hearing me? Whoo! Now listen, it's a pretty building. It's a fine piece of property up here in, in the Berwick, South Bridge area, the west side of Savannah. Fine piece of property. Looks good. I was losing sleep. I wasn't losing weight. Some people get upset they lose weight. I get upset I eat everything I can find. When I come to be the pastor here, I weighed 245 pounds. In six months, I was 325 pounds. Am I lying? I was dying, struggling. Y'all were killing me. Fattening me up just so you could slaughter me at Christmas time. We took that, listen, we took that money, went and found me another bank, renegotiated, paid off a, a big chunk of debt, was able to get locked in at a better interest rate. In the, there's a bunch of stuff that happened. Brother Owen worked with me in some of that. I mean, this was like a two, three year process. It took a long time. Went from $26,000 a month to $8,000 a month. And then a guy walks in my door and says, let me give you this other church. Let me give you this church property. God, what do you want me to do with it? I want you to, I want you to operate a mission out of it. God, missions cost a lot of money. How, how can we pay for it? He said, I just freed $20,000 a month up. How do you think you're going to pay for it? Are you, tell, listen, are you telling me it didn't have God's hand wrote all over it? I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to help you. You could do what you want to do. I'm telling you how I live. I live a blessed life. And it ain't about, it ain't about these fancy cohons I'm wearing either. I'm just, I live a blessed life. I live a life understanding that God has got this thing. He's got it. He's got all of it. 
come on, come on, play this piano. They don't want to hear no more of this. I ain't done. She's just coming to play the piano. <laughs> Why is it that when God is telling you to give, you always, you always try to break it down to the smallest number? What do you want God to do in your life? What do you want God to trust you with? Because I want to go ahead and tell you, he's not going to give you what he can't trust you with. My grandma used to say it like this, and, and listen, she grew up poor, 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 poor. But my gosh, she was blessed. She grew up poor, but she didn't stay poor. She was blessed. And some people, would you would look at her. I mean, she had a nice brick house out in the country, had land. She had this, what was that thing? She had this, this black mercury with chrome rims. Who got a grandma riding around with rims? And they pimped out, man. When my grandmother passed away, she loved shoes. And, and she wanted to have a matching hat and a handbag for every pair of shoes she had. When she passed away, you can't make this stuff up, I counted in her closet 204 pair of shoes. And I know her, anytime she was at church, if somebody said, they'd say, oh, Sister Shorty, I like your shoes. She'd say, what size do you wear? If it's the same size, she'd kick them off. And she'd go buy her another pair. I guarantee, when I saw that 204 pair in the closet, I knew she'd given away 2,000 pair. If she kept, I knew what she'd give away. And she had at least 100 hats and handbags. She lived a blessed life. Some people say, man, she must have she must have made it big, must have made big money. She worked at a factory. She worked the three to eleven shift at a factory. But she was the most generous person I ever met. She would give it away. She's the one that used to tell me, she she she'd say, Alden, my name's Alton, A-L-T-O-N. She pronounced it A-L-D-I-N. She said, Alden. I'm the owner of nothing and the steward of everything. All this stuff belongs to the Lord. So why do you always look for the smallest number to tithe on? Why are you always trying to make the least investment in the kingdom? Why are you always trying to find a loophole that, that you shouldn't give or you don't have to give? If you really believe that you can't outgive God, then um, why are you why are you sneaking around, always trying to show God the least and and and, and hoping that He don't notice the rest? I ain't never come up here and ask you to do nothing I don't do, and I'm here to tell you today, I tithe on it all. I tithe on it all, and I give offerings. Most of us have the wrong understanding about tithing anyway. We, we think that tithing is giving. If you think that tithing is giving, that might be why you struggle with it. Tithing is not giving. Let me say it again. I'm going to say it until we till you imprint on it. Tithing is not giving. Tithing is not giving. Tithing is not giving. Tithing is trusting. Tithing is, is, is trusting, but it, it's not you trusting God, it's God trusting you. That's what tithing is. That's why this verse doesn't say, give your tithe at the storehouse. It says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Everything that I have belongs to God. Everything I have belongs to Him. I am the owner of nothing and I am the steward of everything. Everything I have belongs to God. And so when God commands me to bring the tithe, he's not asking me to give him part of mine. He's asking me to bring the portion that he designated to go to the storehouse. Is anybody picking this up? He's not saying, Alton, I want you to give me what's yours. 
He's saying, out everything that you have is mine. But part of what I put in your hand, I put there so you would give it over here. I gave it to you to ensure that it would make it over there. Tithing is not giving, tithing is trust. God is saying, I trusted you that I gave it to you knowing that you would take it where it goes. He's telling me to bring 10% of what is already his and he's trusted me to hold it and bring it to be used in his house so nobody would ever leave hungry. It would be like if you called the bank today and, um, and, and, you, and you told them, Brother Owen, when you sit on the front, you get picked on. It'd be, if, if you called the bank on Monday and you told them, you said, you know what, I love, I, I'm a fisherman, I love to fish. And um, there's, this, there's this boat down at Bass Pro Shop. I've had my eye on it for a while. And um, um, uh, it's only $41,000. And, 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 and so um, I got a bunch of uh, Bass Pro Shop gift cards at Christmas this year. So I, I'm going to take that. And you told the bank, I need you to debit from my account $41,000. I'm gonna come out and pick up a cashier's check. You didn't ask for a loan. You called them. You said, take this money out of my account. I'm gonna come pick the check up. And the banker responds to you and says, we can't do that. We can't give you that check. Anybody here got words for that bank? I can tell you right now, I ain't talking about a loan. I'm talking about you taking money out of my account. Give me my money. What if they told you, well, that's not a good idea. That boat, that's not a good investment. It, it ain't none of your business what it is. It's my money, right? I just don't think we should give the church that money. What are they going to do with it? Ain't none of your business. And it's God, God's over looking at you saying, listen, you don't get to debate me on what I want to do with my money. That's my money. Now, when we started this thing, God started it out. I know I'm preaching a little bit long, but half of y'all ain't never coming back again. I'm gonna get you where I got you. When we started the message today, it started out with this statement. Would you rob me? You did. That's how, that's how we began, right? I still hadn't seen where the robbing takes place in this. I've had people tell me this before. They say, Pastor, I can't. I can't afford to tithe. If tithing is giving, then you are correct. But if tithing is trusting, you are incorrect. Every money that you have comes with a tithe built into it already. The tithe was a part of the, the tithe is a some portion of the whole. The tithe was already included in it. It was already there. If you didn't put it, if you didn't take it out and bring it to the storehouse, and here's this whole debate, what's a storehouse? It's your, it's your church. Ain't no fancy word for it. What's, what's, what's the storehouse? Where do you go to be fed spiritually? That's your storehouse. If your world fell apart today, who you gonna call? You gonna call the people in this room? You gonna call us to pray with you and love on you and bring bring funeral food to your family, right? Show up at the hospital, pray with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you when life when life hits you between the eyes, it's hard to struggle alone. But when you got a family that loves you, prays with you, supports, hopes for you, where's the storehouse? Right here, baby. This is your storehouse right here. And if this ain't your storehouse, then quit coming here. Go somewhere. If this ain't your storehouse, don't come here. Go somewhere else. That's how I feel about church. I've never been one. I've never tried to say, I've never been one that said, let's go to the biggest church in the city. No, 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 no. I want to pastor the people that God called me to pastor. That's it. That's it. I know Alton Carter ain't everybody's cup of tea. I get it. I know that. If I'm your pastor, you a tough somebody. <laughs> 
Amen. I can tell you right now, I wouldn't sit out there and listen to this abuse. I wouldn't take this. I wouldn't take it. Now, it's the truth. I ain't never lied to you. I'm seldom nice, but I ain't never lied to you. You want me to tell you why I don't lie to you? I don't want you to go to hell. Plain and simple. I don't want you to go to hell and be mad at me because I didn't say something. That's why I am the way that I am. Imagine if you called the bank and told them, I want a check $41,000, I'm going to buy a boat. And the banker said, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, I can't give you that because I drew that money out of your account and I bought a car for myself. What would you do to that banker? And here's God saying, everything that you have, I gave to you. And I trusted you with that tithe. I trusted you with the tithe because I want to make sure, I want to make sure that my storehouse always has food, that nobody will ever leave hungry. What kind of things do you do with our tithes, Pastor? Well, one, I pay your church's bills with it. Two, if you're hungry, we feed you. If you're naked, we clothe you. If you're struggling, we help you. This is the givingest church I've ever been a part of. We give, we give it away. Now listen, every once in a while, I had a guy come by for three weeks in a row. He told the same story every time. I gave him some money the first time. I pulled some money out of my own pocket, gave it to him the second time because I just didn't have time to bother him. Sometimes I would buy a problem. You know what I mean? Like I was busy. We need to talk. And he started going into the same story about how I'm living in a hotel, my best friend, my wife's having an affair. They're on the dining room table. I walked in on them. First time, I'm like, man, that's bad. That's tough. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you a hotel for a week while you're figuring it out. I got you, brother. He come back in the second time, told the same story. And I just didn't have time to deal with it. I just looked, I just put, put my hand in my pocket. I said, listen, I got, I got $127 here. Do, I, that's all I can do today. I ain't got time. And he just left. Sometimes I just buy a problem away. You ever do that? You ever do that? I just want somebody to leave me alone so I give money. That leave, gives people money to leave you alone. That joker come back the third week and was telling me the same story. I said, listen, is this, is like, have you called them three times? Or is it still from the first time? Because brother, you need to move out of that motel and move on. You know, move on. Go kick them out of your house. Kick them off your dining room table. Do something, you know. He looked at me, he said, I done told you that story. I said, three times. He said, I forgot I've been here. <laughs> help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. We help people here with that. We help them. That's what we do. What do you do with our tithes if we help people? We give and we give it. We give to missions. We listen, you probably the best investment you ever made. You went out and hired for yourself the best pastor you could get, my God. Ooh. We pay the preacher, amen. Some people, some preachers are ashamed of that right there. They're like, I don't work, I don't do the Lord's work for money. I don't either, but I do appreciate that check. Come on, let's stand together. How many people here would keep doing business with a bank where the banker said, I took money out of your account and bought something for myself? Let me ask you this. Would, would you make any new deposits at that bank? Would you continue doing business with a bank that made a decision that they know better to do with your money than you know? None of us would. One of the greatest lies that you will ever tell yourself is that you can't afford to tithe because your money comes with a tithe already built in it. It's already there. God has given you 100% of everything that you possess and 10% of it, he wants you to invest in the storehouse. 90% is his gift to you. Again, let me be real clear. Where did the robbery take place? If you did not tithe, 
but you bought a house, then you stole it. That car you driving, you stole it. The clothes you wear, and you stole it. The food you eat, and if you didn't tithe, I'm just telling you, if you didn't tithe, whatever you purchased with it, you stole it. Whether, whether it be food or be uh, Christmas presents, whatever you use God's money for, if you didn't tithe, then whatever you spent it on, you bought it with money that you stole. My God, this is getting rough. <laughs> I'm trying to close the sermon. I, and it just keeps getting rougher. It looks like at the end of the message, I'd be lightening things up. And Let me see if I can help bring some relief right here in this closing statement. Are you ready? It's been a rough morning, God. We, we need to end on a better note. There it is. I see it. So the conversation in Malachi Malachi shows up just happy to be with God. And God says, Malachi, would you ever steal from me? Before you answer that, you did. You did. By God, you stole from me. You stole from me. And I know, I know you think, what did I ever take? The tithe and the offering. You didn't, it wasn't holy to you. You just used it for whatever. You gave when it was convenient. You weren't obedient in the command. You stole that. You stole that from me. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Malachi, you chose, you chose the wrong path because when you steal that from me, you bring a curse on yourself, your life, and on your family, even on this whole nation. You are cursed when you steal from me. You're cursed. Bring all of the tithe. Bring it all, not a piece of it. Bring it all into the storehouse. That money is to be used for something else. And, it, and, and I don't have to tell you, but if you need to know, it's so there will be meat in my house so nobody will ever be hungry at the house of God. So we can take care of whoever's on hard times at the house of God. That's what it's for. Now, I'm mad. And you a thief, but I still love you. Anybody in a relationship like that? Like I told you, ain't nobody, ain't nobody can make me madder than that woman sitting right on the front row right there. Ain't nobody can make me madder than that. I get so mad and I got that weird kind of mad, like I'm good until I ain't. Anybody else that way? There's no gradual like, oh, he's angry now. No, it, it, or, 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 well, I better stop. He's, he's heating up. No, 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 no. It goes from zero to a thousand. It goes from ice cold to blue hot. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. Now you're going to fight whether you want to. Now we're fighting for real now. I, I don't have, I don't know why. And, and I prayed about it for years. Adrian, I prayed about it for years. Ask God to deliver me. He hadn't delivered me. You know why he didn't deliver me? Because it ain't his problem. I don't need deliverance from that. I need discipline. I need to develop. Just say, I'm helping me and you, right? Hey, girl, this heifer make me so mad. Oh, my gosh. And it'll, and it, it, it'll get there. It, this just happened two days ago. Still, I'm still a little salty right now. I'll get so mad, I'll get so mad that I want to burn the house down and kill the dog. You know what I mean? Somebody's got to die, you get that mad. But then after a while, I look at her and I'll say, and I'll still be mad, but I'll look and I'll say, you hungry? <laughs> Anybody else do that? You want something to eat? What you what's for dinner? You know, that's that's code for uh, let's move on. <laughs> so here's God. Would you rob from me? Well, you did, and I'm mad about it. You don't even know what you did. You brought a curse on you, your whole family, and the nation. You ruined everything. You're supposed to be my prophet, and you stole from me. You you 
ruined everything. You stole from me. You, you took what I gave you to give somebody else and you spent it on your dang self. You stole from me. I thought I could trust you. You stole from me. Then he looks and he says, are you hungry? <laughs> he looks right, at, right after, right after, right after God uncovering, right after him exposing, he looks and he says, try me in this. You remember earlier I told you about that guy, David? The rich man with all the lambs took the little man's lamb. You know what God told David about that? When, when, when the sin was exposed, when the prophet said, you are the man. You know what God come back later and told David when David repented and went to worship? God came and he told me, he said, David, have I not given you riches and wealth and fame and power and houses and land? And if it were not enough, if you would have asked me and I gave you some more, you didn't have to steal it. And this is God looking at Malachi and he's looking at us and he's saying, you don't have to steal from me. If you'll just bring it to the storehouse, there's a part of me that you don't even know. And it can only be exposed right here. If you'll prove me in this thing, if you'll take what I gave you and, and, I, and let me know that I can trust you with it. And you bring it where I ask you to bring it. I'll open up the windows of heaven. I'll pour out, I'll pour out on your life things that you can't contain. And let me help you. Let me tell you why we struggle tithing in the local churches because we had too many opulent preachers. You ain't got, listen, you don't have to have a Mercedes. Reverend, a Ford will get you there just fine. But I will encourage you by the nicest Ford you can get. I'm not against people having stuff. I just, for me, I, there, there's just not room for opulence in the pulpit. Does that make sense? There's a pastor, you started bragging on your Kohans while I go, man, shut up. I bought these at TJ Maxx. <laughs> I bought these Kohans at TJ Maxx. They was on the closeout rack. And I knew it was God because you ain't never seen a pair of size 13s on the closeout rack at TJ Maxx. I knew God put them there for me because I tithed. God said, I put these Kohans at TJ Maxx just for you, Alton. I let them sit in that big, I let them sit in the Kohan store for years. People walked past them. I wouldn't let them buy them. I convict their heart. I wouldn't let them buy them. I saved them for an appointed space and an appointed time. And I brought you here. You didn't even want to come. Your wife made you come. You got bored. You were looking around and you happened upon them. And God said, I did this for you. Tell me God won't do it. Tell me God won't do it. I understand why we don't trust preachers. I testified today about negotiating with a bank and a good loan amount and all that. Remember that? You want me to tell you what that first conversation was? The president and the vice president of Southeastern Bank, big bank, big bank, headquarters, Darien, Georgia. Why'd you go to them? I had to go to a private bank because we had, listen, we, we were just in a bad way. All the big banks would just take one look and say, you don't meet the requirements. No, you don't meet the requirements, no. So I said, I need to find a private bank. I need somebody that I don't measure up to a checklist. I need to talk to a person. I got, I got the president of the bank. His name is Con. The vice president's name is John. I got Con and John in a room. Uh, Steve Blanda on our board was with me. I preached my guts out to them guys. I didn't talk business. I preached vision and passion and the church and what we going to do. That man looked at me and laughed and he said, uh, he said, I tell you what, if I didn't live in Darien, I'd know I'd come to church. That's the best sermon I ever heard. He said, now let's talk business. <laughs> he said, you don't meet the requirements. You don't have enough giving units. You don't have enough credit history. You don't, have enough, you don't meet the requirements. He said, if we partner with you, he said, it would be the biggest loan 
in the history of this bank. By the way, Southeastern Bank is the oldest private owned bank in the state of Georgia. And he said this would be, it'd be the largest loan this bank has ever given to a church. And he said, besides that, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, he said, to do business with you, I would violate the three P's rule we have at our bank. I said, what's that? He said, we don't give money to plumbers, painters, or preachers. I don't know why that rule, I don't know why they had that rule, but apparently he'd been done bad by. But he went home that night and God did the rest. Called me back the next day, he said, you don't qualify, but I'm going to bring my board together. And I'm going to pitch this loan myself. We've been doing business with them ever since. Every time I, every time I see them, I can walk in. I can walk into their bank today. They'll walk out of the office. Come to, they'll say, "Best decision we ever made doing business with you. You are the best financial partner we have." Who in God's name is calling me? They know I preach till one o'clock. Who is calling me? They're, whoever's calling me right now should be in church. I'm just here to testify to you over and over and over and over and over, and over again. God did that. God did that. God did that. And I know why you don't trust a preacher. I get it. I know why you don't. But this ain't about you trusting a preacher. And I promise you, whenever God looks at you, when you're able to stand in heaven and he looks at you and he says, would you steal from me? And he's going to answer you before you can answer. You ain't going to be able to offer that rebuttal. Well, that preacher was going to do something with it. I said, I don't care what he did with it. My conversation is about what you did with it. If he did the wrong thing with it, I got a place for him too. All thieves, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire, even pastors, even lying, stealing pastors. It's a place for them too. Try me in this. Put me to the test. Everywhere else, God says, don't. But here, God himself throws down the gauntlet and he declares, put me to the test. I will show you that I mean business. I will show you that if you bring the tithe and the offering into the storehouse, I'll open up windows and rain down blessings you can't contain. This is God saying, I dare you to trust me like I trust you. That's what this covenant's all about. God said, I, I dare you to trust me like I trust you. last verse of the day and we're done God said I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes so he won't destroy the fruit of your ground nor your vine will uh, fare to uh, bear fruit for you in your field says the Lord of hosts and uh, verse 12 and, and all the nations everybody say it with me all the nations and all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land says the Lord you ever feel like you're working harder, you're making more money, and you still can't get ahead? You will never outpace the devourer. At some point, you've got to be honest with yourself. There's spiritual things that happen here, too. There's practical things, and you will reap consequences of bad decisions, but also there are, sometimes there are spiritual things that even when you're doing all the right things, it's still, you still feel like you're losing. There is a devourer. There is a spirit. It is a devourer. It just consumes, 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 and you can't outpace it. You can't make enough money. You can't work hard enough. You can't outpace it. Well, how, how do I get past it? You need God to intervene. There's some devils that you're going to fight in your life that you can't handle. You need, you, God's got to do that. Sometimes God has to step in. How did, Pastor, is that even biblical? Sure is. He had a whole army show up and sing a song because he said, the battle's not yours. This battle's mine. This battle belongs to the Lord. And while they were singing, he sent, God himself went in. He sent the angels in. They won that victory. Anybody remember reading that in the Bible? The battle's not yours. Sometimes you're going to fight stuff that's bigger than you. There's only one place in the Bible, though, where the devourers overcome, right here, Malachi chapter 3. You can't find you can't find any content on the devourer in any other place. It only exists right there in Malachi chapter 3. So God is saying, if, if this is happening to you and you want me to deal with this, 
bring the tithe and offering into the storehouse. I will pour out blessings that you can't contain and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'll shut that, I'll shut his mouth. He won't take from you anymore, won't consume from you anymore. This is God, this is God saying, listen, trust me in this thing, I got you. Not, on, not only am I gonna bless you, I'm gonna break the curse off of you. No, I'm gonna bless you, break the curse off of you and I'm gonna deal with your enemy too. When you trust me like I trust you, this, these are, this is what happens. And here's where we mess it up, family. We ain't got to pray about this today. Pastor, we ain't got time for an altar call because we don't need one. You ain't got to pray about what I preach today. It's just a word. Do it and be blessed. Don't be cursed. That's, that's what you're leaving with today. Here's what the whole thing is about. When you get to the end, what did he say? And all the nations will call you blessed. Do you know that everything Jesus does is always about salvation? Everything God does is always restorative. He's always leading people back to him. It's always putting somebody in a position or putting you in a position where people can receive him. And this whole that we, we, we have so perverted the subject of the tithe. We've made it a get-rich-quick scheme. We've talked to people, give your way out of debt. We've done all this stuff right here. And, and you know what? The thing is, God is just saying, no, 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 no. This is, this is all about trust. I trust you with everything. I trust you with everything. You trust me with the tithe. When this covenant operates... Everybody that knows you will see the difference in your life. And when they ask you, man, what happened? What's different about you? Tell them about me. God's not blessing you so you can just have a bigger house. He's blessing you so you can have a bigger harvest. Am I helping somebody? He's trying, he's trying to position you so everybody around you sees that you are blessed because blessings bring about curiosity and people are going to want to know man, what happened? What's different about you? God did this. God did this. You guys know, you guys know, um, I, I, I spoke at four different conferences this year. I was asked to go speak at four different places where everybody in the room pastors bigger churches than me. And I asked them, I said, why, why, why do you want me to come? I, 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 I need to learn from them. You know what they told me? They said, because you have the testimony. Because most of us have lost sight of it. We need to understand that when we, when we have a real relationship with God, he will put us on a platform, not so we can tell everybody, look at my platform, so we can stand on that platform and tell everybody, look at God. Man, look at God. Look at God. Amen. Speaking of uh, looking at God, I want to close this today with a celebration. I know it's been a, been a long time today. But you can't preach a message like that in a minute. Come back next week. It'll be a special program. It'll be shorter. I'll give you some of your time back next week. I'm running a special on Christmas Eve. If you come to the Christmas Eve service, we're giving a 20% off of time special Christmas Eve service. Mother Nora, will you come up here with me for just a second, please? I want to confirm something. We're not online, are we? I know we had some technical difficulties this morning. Somebody confirm that real fast. I don't want, I don't, I don't, we're not, okay. Don't nobody, I want to share something. I want this going out. Keep it in the room, okay? This is private. You tell people, tell me God won't do stuff. 
when I come to pastor here, sweet Mother Norris, she used to look at me sideways thinking, man, who's this crazy preacher? God ain't called him. He's a, he's a heretic or a lunatic, one of the two. And, um, and I said, said some stuff one day about people and lifestyles and things like that and that it's not the church's job to be enemies. We have to win them. People aren't the problem, they're the point. I don't care I don't care what's going on in their life. Everybody's so upset right now about men that want to be women and women that want to be men. And the, the church is all we do is shaking our, our fist. Man, when we wake up and realize that um if people think if you think that changing your gender is going to bring peace in your life, you're in for a rude awakening. Because one day, you started out as a man, you're going to wake up as a woman, and a few years down the road, you're going to realize, I still got the same struggle. I still feel the same way. I still don't feel like myself. But you done cut all your pieces off now, and you, you see what I'm saying? And the state of that man is worse than it was in the beginning. That's biblical. And you know what the church's answer is? Sinners. Man, we got to win them. You got to be kind. You got to be genuine. You got to know how to love people. You gotta, we got to win people. You got to win people. You got to win people. And I, I and I'd say stuff like that. I don't care if you're gay, straight, trans, lesbian. But you know what I mean? What was it I used to tell my kids? I'd say, I'd say listen, I don't care if it's a, a, a homo, a lesbo, Oreos, or straightos. It don't matter to me. Love them all. Love them all, love them all, love them all, love them all. And some of some people say, Pastor, it ain't right. I didn't say it was right. I still love you. I didn't say it wasn't a sin. It's sin. Homosexuality is a sin. In every form, it's a sin. But I still love you. Jesus still loves you. He'll still save you if you call on it. We think right now, we, some of you think being Republicans is sin. And all, and all those sinners think the Democrats are sin. Pastor, what are you? I, I just love all of you. I love the elephants and the donkeys because the, the lamb is better than either of you. Amen. And so, uh, it was after one of them crazy sermons. And she, she wanted to take me to lunch because she thought I had lost my mind. I'm not going to share all the story or the detail because it ain't my story to tell. That's your story to tell. But I will tell you how it ended. I told her, I said, Mother, if you'll reach out to some people and tell them I, I was wrong. I wasn't wrong to say that you're wrong. I was wrong because I stopped sending the love. I cut some areas off. And sometimes we do that because it hurts. It's hard to send love to a place where they ain't sending it back. And I told her, I said, um, I said, you have a daughter and you haven't spoken. You guys haven't spoken in like a long time, right? Like what was the longest that it had went? Over 20, over 20 years, over 20 years, it, not not one word to the, to her daughter, or back the other way either. It wasn't, it wasn't just you. It wasn't just you. No. <laughs> 20 years. And so after that uh, that lunch at the Cracker Barrel, which was delicious, by the way, we should do that again. <laughs> she started sending that love. And um, this past year, I know that you guys started having conversations again. And it started simple, hello. But sometimes, but listen, after 20 years, hello. You know what I mean? 
Listen, when you told me that, and you know, you know, I'm, you know, I'm weird, right? When she, when she shared that, she, she, she called me. She shared that with me. She said, I talked to my daughter today. What she say? She said, "Hello." You know what I heard in my mind, in my spirit? I heard Lionel Richie. Hello. <laughs> Is it me you're looking for? I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> Hello. The Commodores have come back to life. Um, I brought Sister Norm up here for a couple reasons. One, uh, she made history this weekend. She is now the, the oldest uh, living member and the oldest attending member of Coastal Cathedral at the young, young age of 95. <laughs> So very historical, amen. I pray that uh, that the anointing of life that you have would overflow on us all. Did anybody receive that? Amen. I don't want to just be 95. Listen, she still lives by herself, cooks, cooks for herself and others, drives her own car. You know what I mean? So I want to be 95 like that. I don't want to be 95 at the nursing home. I want to be 95. I want to be that kind of 95, right? Amen. So, woo. We're going to put Mother Nora on display outside and everybody just walk by and just touch her on the way out. Get what you can. But I also wanted to say, I'm just telling you, you can't out give God. And it ain't. And it, and it, ain't. And it ain't always about the money. Amen. But when you God has given to you and there is nothing greater that he gave to us than love and when you learn to give love like God gives love it changes changes everything and so um, a little bird told me, a gossiper told me they were gossiping is what it was, but they told me that your daughter came to your house to tell you happy birthday Man, tell me God won't do it. Tell me God won't do it. I'm telling you. I'm, we've been here for a long time today and we've dwindled down. This room is practically empty at this point. But I believe for those who have remained, you have endured to the end. What you heard me preach today is not a story that I told. I brought Mother Nora up to show you. These are not stories that I tell. These are people I know. These are things that happen in people's lives, real things, real, real things. And God will do the same thing in your life. Trust him with everything that you have. Trust him with your finances, trust him with your gifts, your talents, trust him with your family, trust him with your ministry, your calling. Trust God with everything that you have and be generous in every area that you have. Give to all men freely and prove God and see if he wouldn't open the windows of heaven, pour out blessings, rebuke devourers, and put you in a place where the whole nation calls you blessed. Just put him to the test and see that God wouldn't do these things in your life. Mother, you are the oldest and the wisest of us all. Well, you've been here a lot longer than the rest of us, so I'm sure you know. I'm sure you know. I'm sure you have figured out by this time what to do and what not to do. You heard me preach today. Would would you say I was 100% accurate in everything I told these people? I would say, I would say, I would say that you're 100% accurate have been ever since you came to this place and the last 10 years of my life because of this family, the Carter family, his wife, Beth, and pastor, my life has been changed completely and I've enjoyed it. I came to know Jesus when I was eight years old, but the last 10 years because of this family have been 10 of the greatest years of my life. And the other thing I want to say is what you just heard about what happened with my daughter happened because of the prayers of the people of this family. And I thank God for them. 
I thank God for them. I know that God answered that prayer because of them. I could name the families, but that's most of you. It would take me all day. So I just want to say thank you, and I want to say thank you to you, Pastor. And I can say to you, after 95 years, God is faithful. If I had one word of testimony, it's the faithfulness of God. Even before I came to know him at eight years old, twice God saved my life. Uh, the devil tried to kill me twice before I was a year old, and uh, God saw to it that he didn't. And I guess he had plans for me for the rest of my life. But I thank him for these 95 years. He has been so good. It would take me too long to tell you all of the wonderful things that God has done. But thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for your yes. faithfulness, Lord. Amen. Amen. Brother, I appreciate your kind words. I just want to correct one thing, okay? You were wrong. I was going to correct you, and I need to do it in front of everybody because I don't want them to be wrong, all right? It wasn't this man. It's that man. It was that man. Amen. So. But I appreciate it. Amen. I appreciate it. All glory and honor be to God. Amen. Uh, I love being your pastor. One of the joys of my life. Matter of fact, there's been a lot of times I was going to quit, but I said, what would Nora do without me? And so I could come back. I'm kidding. Uh, listen, uh, right behind you is one of our special friends. Uh, no, the other behind you. Just keep turning. There you go. There you go. One of our, one of our uh, special friends, a servant partner here at the Cathedral, Jennifer Snyder, has a, a gift to you. There are 95 roses in this bundle here. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Can we give uh, Mother Nora and um, just a happy, happy birthday today? Happy birthday. We love you. Appreciate you. Um, and if you're here today and it's your birthday, happy birthday to you too. Uh, uh, I think Oscar, you and Oscar Torres share the same birthday. So, uh, Oscar, when Mother Nora is ready to go and do her work in heaven, it's your job to do her work here. You're welcome. Amen. So, uh, we love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.